Greetings, saludos everyone. On behalf of the National Behavioral Health Association and the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center, we welcome you to our webinar, Vaping 101 and Latino Youth, Devices, Risk, Prevention Efforts and Solutions. My name is Dolka Michelle Celaya, and the project coordinator for the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center. I will be your host for today's webinar. Before I introduce you to the presenter, here are some brief instructions about today's presentation. The webinar will be recorded and archived for future playback. It will be closed captioned in Spanish and eventually also in Portuguese. The lines will be mute throughout the presentation. When we get to the QA portion of our webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions by typing your question into the QA box, and I will present your question to our speakers. Although we are now providing continuing education credit for this event, we plan to do so for future events. For this webinar, we can provide you with an electronic certificate of attendance with 1.4 hour credit upon request when you complete the evaluation. So let's begin. Please change the slide. Thank you. Let's start by introducing the National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center that is housed at the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, NALBA. NALBA is a nonprofit organization located in New Mexico. NALBA was established to fill a need for a unified national voice for Latino population in the behavioral health arena and to bring attention to the great disparities that exist in areas of access, utilization, practice-based research, and effectively trained personnel. Our National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center is part of the PTTC network, which is an international, multidisciplinary resource for professionals in the prevention field. Established in 1993 by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SANSA. The PTTC network is comprised of 10 domestic regional centers, six international HIV centers funded by PEDFAR, two national focus area centers, and a network coordinating office. Together, the network serves the 50 U.S. states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Island, and the Pacific Islands of Guam. America Samoa, Palau, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and the Mariana Islands. The International HIV ATTC serves Vietnam, South Asia, South Africa, and Ukraine. Here you will see a map of the US-based PTTCs. The National Hispanic and Latino Prevention Technology Transfer Center has a national focus on Latino and Hispanic communities and the workforce that provide services to these communities. Please change the slide. PTTC is staffed by Dr. Pierluigi Mancini, our project director, Alex Santos, executive administrative assistant, and myself, Dolka Michelle Celaya, project coordinator. Please change the slide. Also, we'll be asking you to fill out a brief evaluation at the end of this webinar. This evaluation survey is important to the work we do and provide us with the opportunity to improve our training efforts and secure fundings to continue our work. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation. Change the slide. Now, it is my honor to introduce today's presenter, Ms. Judy Messi and A.B. Baker Butler. Ms. Judy Messi 
graduated from Cornell University with a degree in psychology and joined the Peace Corps as a health educator in West Africa. Since then, she has worked in substance abuse field, first counseling teenagers, and later directing community-based programs. She completed her master in human resource management at Mercy College. Currently, as a director of community-based program for Student Assistance Service Corporation, Judy developed and supervised community-based substance abuse and problem gambling prevention programs in diverse communities. Abby Baker Butler is a junior at Blind Brook High School. Abby served as the student representative to the Blind Brook Community Coalition and by president of the Westchester County Youth Advisory Board. Abby was instrumental in the passage of Westchester County Tobacco 21 legislation and now is working on initiative at the state and county level. He is the Director of Legislative Advocacy and Expansion for the student-led nonprofit Youth Decide on Preventing Substance Abuse. AB's dedication to the public health is evidenced by his role as a co-founder of the Westchester Student Coalition Against Guns Violence. He was selected as the 2019 Westchester County Public Health Honoree. AB has been presented on the MBC in connection with his gun and safety advocacy. He was recently selected as one of the two New York delegates for the 2019 United States Senate Youth Program. AB believes that regulation and education are the key for preventing teen e-cigarette use. Judy and AB, welcome. It is an honor to have both of you Please proceed with your presentation. Thank you for having us. Thank you for that great introduction, Dolka. Uh, so, hello everyone. I hope you're having a great afternoon. Uh, to start, we're gonna take a look at this slide here. As you can see, we have six items. Um, they all look very brightly colored and interesting. Um, and some of them are vaping related and others are not. So now there's gonna be a poll that's gonna pop up on your screen and you'll have to tell us which of these items are and are not vaping related. Uh, so choose the letters that you think are not vaping related, and then we'll come back together and see what the actual answers were. Okay. So if everyone's finished, uh, let's come back together. So the correct answer was that products C, D, and E are vaping related, while A, B, and F are not. Taking a quick look at the results here, um, it looks like we had a generally good guess, um, but as you can probably tell from all these pictures, it's very hard to distinguish vaping related items from non-vaping related items. Um, the only way that these items are really distinguishable is by um, the clearly visible milligram measurements on items C, D, and E, and if you look at the top of item D, uh, it says vapor five. But other than that, they're very easily concealable. So to continue, uh, so what are e-cigarettes? Well, the official name isn't actually e-cigarettes. To be scientific, the name is Electronic Nicotine Delivery Systems, or ENDS. So the history behind ENDS is that they were originally developed as a safer alternative to regular cigarettes as a way to assist smokers in cutting down quitting. Um, because they burn nothing and do not um, conduct combustion, they release no smoke, and so they are slightly better for health than traditional cigarettes. However, e-cigarettes still have many negative health effects, and in recent years, many non-cigarette users have started using e-cigarettes, which is causing a public health crisis. Many of these new users of e-cigarettes are youth, and this is causing a serious number of unintended consequences. Ends can come in many different forms, and there's no standard definition of what an e-cigarette looks like. They can have different designs and arranged ingredients, and the variety of names is endless. Hookah, box mod, e-hookah, vape pen, jewel, pen mod, cigalike. There are so many different names and forms, as you can see from the image on the right of this slide, for e-cigarettes that can be hard to keep track. But what they all have in common is that they are originally intended as smoking cessation devices that have, you could say, gone off the rails, 
and are um, hurting teen health. But one thing that all e-cigarettes do have in common is this basic mechanical structure. Um, all e-cigarettes contain a battery connected to a switch which activates a heating element and a microprocessor which then heats up a cartridge of e-juice. Um, so this e-juice usually contains nicotine and propylene glycol, which is an ingredient in jet fuel, as well as many other chemicals. If you go to this slide, we can see many different types of vaping products. The one the second um, from the left in the top row uh, looks very whimsical. It's a device called a Sorin. Um, and you can see it looks more different than what you traditionally expect from an e-cigarette. Um, so they really come in a variety of different forms. To talk a little bit more about what's in this e-juice in the cigarette, e-cigarettes, um, some have nicotine, which is an extremely addictive chemical found in cigarettes, and others do not. Um, but they can come with a variety of different chemicals, including diacetyl, propylene glycol, which I mentioned, as well as many derivatives um, and other chemicals related to marijuana that can be inserted into e-cigarette cartridges. Um, together, this wide mix of chemicals without a large amount of regulation and with many different negative effects of each one um, makes e-cigarettes very dangerous because each of these chemicals has negative health effects on the body, and when combined together, these negative health effects are aggravated and exacerbated. There are also different kinds of ends and different ways that the e-cigarette processes the e-juice. Some e-cigarette devices come pre-filled with a liquid that may or may not contain nicotine, such as hookah sticks, while others, such as the Juul e-cigarette, which is extremely popular among youth, come with pods or cartridges filled with e-juice that must be inserted into the device. Others have attachments where users can place their own liquid or leaf in the case of marijuana if they are mixing it. Here on this slide, we can see an example of the popular Juul device. As you can see, it's very sleek. Um, comes in very bright colors, and it's relatively easy to hide because it looks like a flash drive. Um, the cartridges, as you can see on the right side of the image, are also relatively small, yet each one of those cartridges has two and a half to five times the amount of nicotine as is present in a pack of cigarettes. Not in one cigarette, in a pack of cigarettes, all in one of those cartridges. Um, given that many teens say they can go through these in as little as a day, this is extremely concerning as it's causing increased addiction among youth. Let's talk a little bit more about the Juul popular e-cigarette products. Um, this is the type of e-cigarette all varieties contain nicotine, yet many teens don't notice, which makes them perceive it as less harmful and it's really extremely harmful. The nicotine in Juuls is also in a form that is especially easily absorbed. It's a nicotine salt, unlike in cigarettes. This makes it even more potent than other vape devices because it can enter the bloodstream easily. In addition, juuling has taken on its own meaning, its own definition um, as a slang, cool practice. Many teens don't consider it vaping, even though they really are the exact same thing. And they consider juuling as a less powerful alternative, as a fun, cool pastime, when really it is not. In addition, juuls are very easily accessible. They're, um, very, uh, they have very low regulations on them, and they're sold at many local gas stations and mini markets, which makes them easy for teens to buy. Uh, later on, we'll be talking a little bit about Tobacco 21, which is um, meant to control this. In addition, Juul pods can be quote unquote hacked. So this is a little different than the hacking you might associate with a computer, um, but the principle is the same. You can take the Juul e-cigarette pods and add other liquids and drugs and chemicals with unintended side effects, um, which can range from marijuana to other flavorings. It can really be anything. And the problem with this is that there's no way to know how these chemicals and their negative health effects will interact with what's already in the Juul. Here on this slide, you can see a picture of the Sorin device, a type of e-cigarette. Um, and why, why this slide is notable is that it doesn't look like what you would traditionally visualize as uh, something that looks like a cigarette. It's a totally different looking device, yet it serves the same function, has the same negative health effects, um, even though it does come in sleek and cool colors. Here, you can see another example of a vape pen with replaceable cartridges. As you can see in the green container in the background of the slide, um, you can really insert anything into those cartridges, whether it's marijuana, wax, any other sort of flavoring or chemical. Um, this can have many negative effects. In addition, I, I have heard of this myself and seen it in my school, vape pens are very easily concealable. As you can see, they look almost exactly 
like a flash drive for a computer. They really release no odor, and they can be easily concealed in one's pocket. Um, so it can be very hard for teachers or even other students to see um, when peers have jewels or other e-cigarettes. And this makes them harder to track and regulate. So now I'll turn it over to my amazing co-presenter, Judy, to talk a little bit more about trends with Hispanic youth. Thanks so much, Abe. I always love listening to Abe talk about this. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to young people and parents and professionals about vaping, and people are always asking me, how come kids don't get it? And I'm like, oh no, kids get it, and a lot of kids do, and uh, Abe is just one of our amazing student leaders that absolutely uh, gets it better than any of us uh, could possibly imagine. So this poll that's about to pop up on your screen is uh, specific to Hispanic or Latino youth. And the question is, uh, what do you think? Are Hispanic youth more or less likely to vape than their non-Hispanic peers? And your options are gonna be yes, no, and it depends. So any minute now, yep, there we go, that will pop up. Give people a chance to enter it. I'll sing the theme to Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. Okay, give you a minute, and now. I think we will move on. So what do we say? Some, oh, some yes, some no, and some it depends. So the, um, the it depends people win because it really does depend. And uh, we're, the, next thing, the next bunch of slides we're gonna look at are a series of data slides. So for all of you data geeks out there, here we go. And for all of you that uh, aren't data geeks, just bear with us because it is important to follow a model that talks about assessment first and to look and see what's going on in a community. So the first group of slides we're gonna look at are from something called Monitoring the Future, which is a national survey, <coughs> excuse me, that's done annually and it's done with eighth, 10th, and 12th grade students um, across the country. The measure that we're looking at here on this slide is past 30 day use and the field of substance abuse prevention thinks of past 30 day use as current use. So if we're talking about, are you using currently, we're talking about, did you use in the past 30 days? And this slide is um, students that said that they vaped anything. So on the next couple of slides, we're gonna see that the blue line is always gonna be Hispanic youth, the red line is always gonna be white youth, and the green line is always gonna be African American youth. So this survey found that um, in the first cluster of columns is eighth grade, then 10th grade, then 12th grade. So the pattern here is that in eighth grade, Hispanic youth are more likely to vape than their white or African American peers. But that trend changes in 10th grade and 12th grade where they are far less likely to vape than their white peers, and, but more likely to vape than the African American peers. If we move to the next slide, we are now gonna look at this grade by grade and talk about what people are vaping. So this slide talks about eighth grade and it breaks it down. So now the column clusters are, did you vape anything? You know, did you vape something that was just flavorings? Did you vape nicotine? And did you vape marijuana? And I just put a caveat in there that a lot of time kids have no idea what it is that they're vaping, but this is self-report. This is what the kids said that they were vaping. So um, again, the uh, blue line is gonna be your Hispanic um, youth. Um, the red line is the white youth and the green line is the African-American youth. And for this, we can see that uh, vaping just flavorings um, is about equal for Hispanic and white youth. Vaping nicotine, a little bit less for Hispanic youth. Um, African-American youth are much less likely to report vaping anything. And vaping marijuana among eighth grade students looks like more Hispanic students are reporting vaping marijuana than either their white or their African-American peers. As I move to the next slide, we're gonna be looking at the same set of data, but for 10th grade students. So for 10th grade students, we see a little bit of a difference in any sort of vaping and va vaping just flavorings or vaping nicotine. Uh, um, Hispanic youth are less likely than their white peers, but more likely than their African-American peers to be engaging in this activity. Um, in terms of vaping marijuana, they're about even with their, um, uh, with their white peers, but still more at, than African-American peers. So that's 10th grade. And the following slide that we're about to see now will be 12th grade, which fits very much the same pattern as, um, as our 10th grade use. So that's looking at um, 
at uh, comparing Hispanic, uh, nationally Hispanic, white, and African American youth from the Monitoring the Future survey. The next slide is also from the Monitoring the Future survey, but now we're just looking at Hispanic youth and we're looking at year over year from 2016 to 2018. So we're just, so the, both of these lines, both all of the lines pertain to Hispanic youth. This is past 30 day vaping anything. And you can see that there's, the takeaway on this slide is just that there was an increase from 2016 to 2018. And in fact, that is something that we found among all all of students is that there have been huge increases from uh, 14 to 15 to 16 to 17 to 18. And my, my guess is uh, we'll see that again in 19, but more will be revealed about that. So um, this um, slide here is your citation for the data slides that preceded this. So for all of your data geeks that want to do a deeper dive into this, um, I love this survey. This is um, a fabulous, a wealth of information for anybody working in the substance abuse field. And this data was taken specifically from one of their occasional paper series. So um, a shout out to this group that does such great work. We are now gonna move into looking at a different data set. And um, this is from the CDC, the Centers from Disease Control. And they use a different survey. They don't use the Monitoring the Future survey. They look at something called YRBS, which stands for Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And they put all their data online as well. And it's called Youth Online. Um, they have some really wonderful um, technology that one can use to do uh, cross tabulations on all sorts of different things. Um, and one of the nice things about about the uh, CDC's YRBS data is that they actually show data by geographic location. Not all geographic locations are represented, but some of the major geographic locations are. I just pulled out a couple. I took the Bronx. I was born in the Bronx. My father was raised in the Bronx. Uh, the Bronx is just, um, just south of where uh, Abe and I are sitting right now in Westchester County, New York. And then I pulled a couple of other locations that I thought um, that have a higher percentage uh, or um, a relatively large representation of Hispanic and Latino uh, youth. And you can see that there are large differences. So um, the blue lines in this regard, this is all Hispanic youth. The blue lines represent S30 day use and the orange lines represent um, daily use. So you can see in the Bronx, this is an issue, uh, huge. About 20% of kids said that they, um, of high school students said that they um, vaped in the last 30 days, and 3% are vaping daily. And compare that to the very last set of columns, which is Puerto Rico, where you see just about 4.7% of students say that they vaped in the last 30 days, and only um, one half of 1% are indicating that they vaped, um, that they're vaping daily. So this is just to remind us that um, we can't make broad sweeping generalizations about all Hispanic or Latino youth, that there are geographical differences um, and there are very local differences. So uh, we all need in our own communities to do our own assessment to find out what's happening um, very locally. The next slide punctuates that further. Um, this is not about vaping, but this is also just to continue to make the point that um, we cannot make broad generalizations about a whole set, a whole community. Uh, this is looking at smoking rates among um, different populations within the Latino community, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Mexicans. And you can see there's a wide range of reporting of smoking. So again, we need to just we need to do our own local data assessment. We need to find out what's happening in our own communities so that we can best serve the people that we're working with. And now we are back to Abe. Thank you for that, Judy. Um, so we talked a little bit about the issues with nicotine. I think a lot of us already know that nicotine is an addictive chemical that can cause many negative effects from all of the education and research that's been done on cigarettes. But the thing about vape pens and e-cigarettes is that they, are, uh, they cause many negative health issues independent of nicotine. So to start, vaping, even secondhand exposure, is associated with bronchitis and asthma, two very serious conditions. In addition, you who vape are seven times more likely to smoke cigarettes, which then brings on a whole host of negative health effects which we know about associated with cigarettes. In addition, many vaping devices have been shown to possibly be contaminated with harmful bacterial and fungal toxins, according to Harvard University, um, which can be extremely dangerous, um, even more so than digesting these toxins, because the way a vape 
um, or e-cigarette device functions is that these toxins are vaporized. And so they're entering the lungs in a form that's soluble that can easily get into the bloodstream, um, which can make these um, toxins even more deadly if there's an infection. And that just leads into another point um, that I think many people um, should understand, that the flavoring and other ingredients in vape pens, for example, let's take something like cinnamon. It may be fine to eat it um, because you have certain protections in your digestive tract, in your stomach, you have certain enzymes um, that can help digest that and keep the, the negative parts of cinnamon from interacting with your body. But when cinnamon or cinnamon derivatives or similar flavors are being put into an e-cigarette, the, all the components of that substance are being vaporized, they're going right into your lungs, they're going right into your sinuses, they're going right into your blood and to your brain. Um, and that can cause a host of negative health effects. But we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Uh, to continue with the negative health issues associated with these cigarettes, the aerosol and vape clouds can also contain cancer-causing chemicals such as benzene and chromium, as well as other um, dangerous metals such as nickel. In addition, vaping is associated with gum disease, tooth loss, and bad breath. All of the dentists and uh, any person's nightmare. <laughs> so to go back a little bit to the flavorings of these cigarettes, many youth who start vaping say they started because of the flavorings, which is something key to realize when we think about how we can stem on um, the tide of youth vaping and engage in prevention efforts while not harming um, former smokers who are trying to use these cigarettes to stop. In addition, many common vape juice flavorings pose dangers to cells that line blood vessels and lymph vessels. These flavors can include mint, vanilla, cinnamon, which I just discussed, clove, butter, strawberry, banana, and eucalyptus. And something I'd like to bring your attention to with these flavors is that they're not bland in any way. These are clearly whimsical flavors meant to attract new users, meant to market to a new audience. I mean, just look at eucalyptus. That's not your standard run of the mill flavor. It's looking to attract people. Um, in addition, all of the flavor chemicals, um, when tested in studies, were found to have high concentrations that cause cell death. In addition, even low concentrations of flavors such as menthol, clove, vanilla, cinnamon, and burnt flavors caused inflammation in cells and reduced the production of nitric oxide, which is a molecule that's extremely important to keep blood vessels functioning in a healthy way. And that ties in to what I was discussing before about on these flavors and chemicals reaching the brain even more quickly. In addition, flavoring compounds used in vaping products have adverse effects on cardiovascular health, which can lead to an increased risk of heart attacks. So on the whole, the flavorings, the substances that aren't flavorings, everything in e-cigarettes has a whole host of negative health consequences. And on top of all of that, when you think about an e-cigarette, it's a device that is heating up a liquid to very high temperatures and then putting it into your mouth. Um, so what could go wrong with that? You can see on this slide, beyond the substances in it, vapes can malfunction, e-cigarettes can malfunction, and when that happens, they can explode. And on this slide, you can see many instances of the very negative effects that can occur when that happens. Um, so this is also something to be aware of when we think of the consequences of e-cigarette use. In addition, let's go back to the nicotine in e-cigarettes. Nicotine is a powerful stimulant that is highly addictive, according to the US Surgeon General, and especially in teens, it can disrupt executive function. It can prime the brain for other addictions. This has a twofold negative effect. First, it can act as a gateway drug, leading to use of cigarettes and other dangerous substances. And at the same time, by disrupting executive functioning, it can inhibit performance in school, it can inhibit social relationships, it can inhibit extracurriculars and athletics, um, and it can lead to an overall host of negative consequences throughout life. In addition, the nicotine strength in vape products can be so strong that they can cause nicotine overdose in youth. Um, and so nicotine overdose isn't a term that we hear all that often in our you know, general colloquial dialogue. Usually we hear about heroin overdose or opioid overdose. But nicotine overdose is just as negative and dangerous a condition. Um, in our area, in Westchester County and across the country, many instances have been observed of nicotine overdose causing seizures, which can be deadly. Um, and nicotine also inflames lung tissue and re reduces lung tissue's ability to act as a barrier to foreign substances, which can have many negative consequences and also make it easier for the chemicals we discussed in e-cigarettes to enter the blood and the brain. Now, as I mentioned, um, many teenagers are mixing marijuana with the chemicals already in e-cigarettes, um, and it's important to be aware of the slang surrounding marijuana as we discuss this. So a lot of the slang applies to marijuana in general, 
um, but um, I'll touch on the ones that are most specifically used in relation to e-cigarettes. Some of the ones that um, I hear most often are wax, dabs, um, 420, um, but all of these, including Keef, um, Kush, Hirba Yerba, Mota, um, these are all commonly used words to refer to marijuana. And so it's just important for us uh, to be aware of these as educators, as students, um, to understand what people are discussing when they're discussing um, their current use. On this slide, you can see a number of pictures of hash oil and other derivatives of marijuana and other chemicals that are used in e-cigarettes. Um, when these are mixed with the chemicals in e-cigarettes, it can cause a host of negative consequences. And as you can see, um, just due to the way the material is constructed, it's not easily broken down by the body. It's not good for the body. It's not the type of thing you want to be ingesting. Yet many people are putting it in these cigarettes. For this slide, we can see our um, jewel package again. Uh, the reason we put this slide up here again is just to show that a lot of these marijuana derivatives are being put into those cartridges we discussed before. Um, and also, here you can see examples of e-cigarettes that have been adapted to, to function specifically with marijuana. <coughs> Excuse me. On the left, you can see a version of an e-cigarette um, that has been hacked, uh, as we discussed earlier. So um, the, the thing that looks like a syringe um, in the hand in, in the left photo can be used to inject marijuana into the cartridge um, of the vaping device, which allows marijuana to be vaped. And on the right, we have an even more overt example of marijuana in e-cigarettes. As you can see, this one is actually being marketed as a cartridge with e-juice with marijuana already in it. Um, so this is something that is happening a lot, and it's not something that you need to be a, a genius or an expert to be able to figure out how to get marijuana into your e-cigarette. Again, we can see a vape pen here for placeable cartridges. Um, you can see that marijuana can be placed inside of it. Um, and another thing that I'd like to illustrate with this slide is that when it comes to e-cigarettes, marijuana is not just the green leafy substance that we have visualized in years past. <coughs> there are many sorts of derivatives, oils, um, it comes in a variety of forms, all um, with many negative health effects. But the thing about the oils that are being used with e-cigarettes is that they often have a higher potency than the traditional marijuana leaf, um, which can exacerbate these negative effects. Now let's play another guessing game. One of the products on this slide, that's divided into A and B, has flavorings and no nicotine, while the other one has high potency marijuana extracts. So my question for you is which photo, which device has the high potency THC extracts, A or B? Um, so take a guess in this poll, uh, and then we'll come back together and discuss. Okay, so if everyone's had a chance to make their selection, let's discuss. So the answer is B. B has high potency marijuana extract. Oh, no, actually, as I'm looking at the results here, only 40% of people said B. And that actually proves the point I was about to make, um, that these devices look so similar that they are easily confusable, easily um, switched. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and yet, one of them, has flavorings, which as I mentioned, have negative health effects, but nowhere near the negative consequences of using a device with high potency marijuana extracts as well. Um, so this is an example of how marketing can be deceiving, how devices can look so similar um, as to maybe start even unknowing consumers um, on the path to marijuana use. In addition, here you can see some more examples of how marketing of marijuana-related e-cigarette products is targeted towards new users. One part of this slide that really jumps out, as me, jumps out at me is in the upper left corner, um, where you can see the psychedelic-looking ice cream sundae, banana, and cake. Um, that is clearly attractive to new users. It's trying to get people to buy the product who may not already be using marijuana-related e-cigarette products. Um, it's something to be aware of, especially when companies and others claim that they are not marketing to new users or to youth. Now I'll turn it back over to Judy. Thank you so much, Abe. Um, I really appreciate that information. And um, 
Yeah, marijuana. It's this wasn't a um, a webinar about marijuana, but these days it's impossible to discuss vaping without discussing marijuana. So that's why we uh, included those slides with a brief overview. Um, but more information can be available for uh, people that want information specifically about that. So Abe and I uh, live and um, well, I work and Abe goes to school in a uh, community that is just north of New York City. It's a suburban uh, uh, county where uh, many people are working and uh, commuting into New York City. And uh, it's a very diverse county. We have a large um, population of Hispanic and Latino youth, um, black youth, white youth, Asian. We're actually um, a real microcosm of the world. Um, and so um, I myself, in my work at Student Assistant Services, I have the opportunity to speak to lots of young people all the time. It's actually a pleasure of mine to be able to get out and speak to young people all the time. Um, but in preparation for this, when, uh, when Dolk and I first started talking about this webinar, I thought, gee, let me actually go out and have some real purposeful listening sessions with specifically Hispanic, Latino uh, parents and youth. And we asked a series of questions. We met with about, we spoke to about, um, I would say about 30 parents and over 100 youth. So again, this is added to our general um, work though with, uh, with all sorts of um, young people and parents throughout Westchester. Um, our biggest takeaway with the parents was a lack of awareness about vaping. And I would say that I could say this about all parents in Westchester. I am astonished by how many times I go out and I hand around the jewel um, vape device and people have no idea what it is, um, have not heard about it even. But I would say that this was probably even more true of the Hispanic parents, um, a, a real lack of awareness about vaping, what it is, what devices look like, and that the youth were involved. In one um, community in particular, the place that I was holding the listening session was literally next door to a gas station that was plastered with advertisements for Juul. And after the listening session, I walked everybody over to just sort of take a look um, at what was immediately next door to us. It was also, it's also right across from the local middle school and high school. When we spoke to the youth, we asked them a series of questions about what they thought of um, uh, vaping in their community, in the Hispanic community. And many of them thought that it looked very similar to all the other vaping that was going on, except that their perceptions were that their white peers were more likely to vape. Um, and they thought that this was tied to disposable income. So that may be specific to our area, um, but that was uh, one of the takeaways that we um, came up with. The, um, we were talking with um, Dolka about this. So one of the things we asked them was, "What are you? What, what words are you using?" And so uh, the bullet point three over here is uh, we were talking about the fact that there is no official translation of the word vaping to Spanish, and uh, we hear all sorts of uh, we hear vap vapiar, and the kids were telling us that they call it vapio or vapiar. So one of the things that I do when young people tell me something is that I hashtag it and go on Instagram uh, because I wanna see whether this is something that one student is telling me or whether this is really a thing. So this looks like a thing because when you go to Instagram and you hashtag VEPIR or VEPIO, there is a host of um, hits pardon that pun there. There's a host of information that comes up. Here's one in particular that I decided to uh, share with you all today. This is a post that comes up when you hashtag that PR and it's the, um, the green family, the, the family smoke in green. So the green family smoke. Smoke is a brand, S-M-O-K. It's a brand of um, e-cigarettes. Um, Abe and I, we are sitting at a, at a table um, in, our, in my office with a bunch of e-cigarettes in front of us just for inspiration, and we actually have a smoke device right in front of us. So you can see you have all sorts of, as Abe said before, these come looking all sorts of different ways, and it, this ad is asking you uh, which one do you like best. So we're not going to... We're not going to poll you on that, which one you like best. I just wanted you to get a sense of what happens when you uh, go and look on um, 
social media about this. And speaking of social media, I think it is really, really vital that we as uh, professionals working with any youth um, follow the social media that they're looking at, listen to what they're listening to, and, and comment on um, what they're seeing. I actually, um, I'll never forget going in to speak to a group of uh, young um, black women, girls, about underage drinking, and as I walked in, they were all singing along the lyrics to a song, Weed is My Best Friend and which was a, a song and i and i actually stopped what i was doing and made them rewrite the lyrics of the song to have something positive be their best friend uh, because i feel like what you put in your head uh, what you put in your brain affects your behavior including the music so what we have here are screenshots from different um music uh, music videos now <clears throat> Just bear with me here because I'm, I'm told by the youth that I got these from that what we have here is a collection of Bad Bunny, Cardi B, and No Brainer, which I'm led yep. to believe is a Justin Bieber uh, um, music, music video. video. So you can see the references to the very overt references to vaping. And it's very important that we watch what our kids are watching, listen to what they're listening to and comment on it. Um, as I was doing my research on this, I then came up with this article, uh, which I thought was interesting about hip hop fueling vape, the vape culture. I mean, the same really could be said for all sorts of different, um, uh, musical genres, but this article was specifically about hip hop. And it talks about warning that the industry targets minorities. Now this is nothing new. We have known for a long time that um, the alcohol industry, the tobacco industry target um, minorities, target vulnerable populations. This is not new, but it's certainly something that all of us that work in the um, Latino and Hispanic communities need to keep our eyes on and need to keep at the forefront of the work that we do. Um, during our listening sessions, we, we ask kids about parental attitudes, and this slide really punctuates a fascinating discussion that came up. I had about six, we had about 60 um, Hispanic youth in the room, and we were asking them about uh, their parents and vaping. And it was fascinating because we really had almost a 50-50% divide with half of the kids saying, my parents speak almost no English, or my parents work three jobs just to afford to live in this community. And I just tell them that vaping is totally safe and normal and I can hide it from them and they're just totally clueless. And the other half of the students were like, what are you talking about? My parents monitor and notice everything that I do. There's no way that I can get away with vaping. So again, all to say that when you're doing the work in your own community um, to uh, be to have cultural awareness, we really need to talk to the people in our communities and um, find out what their, what their experience is. Um, both youth and parents, this falls under the, um, this falls under the no-brainer category. Yes. So both youth and parents indicated that it would be helpful for presentations to be held in Spanish or with a translator and for Spanish language materials to be available. So um, we do have some Spanish language resources at the end for you. We have up on the screen a couple that are quite good. Um, it's something that we try here in Westchester to be very mindful of, not just in Spanish, but as we work with other populations to be uh, linguistically competent. Um, but I cannot say with full confidence that, that we have attained that, but it's certainly something that we strive for. And now, Abe is up. Okay, so thank you, Judy. Um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about common objections when um, one tries to help peers or students make vape-free decisions. So many times when I, and so th these are from my experience as well as the experience of others, um, these are common objections that people have when you try to tell them that vaping or e-cigarette use is bad. Um, so let's go through them one at a time. So first, it's only flavored water. Second, it's safer than cigarette use. Um, and third, everyone's doing it. Um, so just take a second and think about that. Um, but now I'll go through them and explain some of the best ways to respond to these um, in a productive and constructive way. So to the one that it's only flavored water, um, 
that is false on a variety of levels. Just because it's a liquid with flavoring does not mean it's flavored water. As we discussed earlier, there can be a variety of chemicals, nicotine, dangerous flavor flavorings, propylene glycol, which is an ingredient in jet fuel. Um, so it's really much more than flavored water. Um, so we can push back on this uh, false assumption with facts to the contrary. The second one, it's safer than cigarette use, um, is a little bit um, more difficult to combat, but it's still um, not a correct statement. So although many the implication of the statement by the person who's saying it is that it's safer than cigarette use, therefore it's okay to use it. Um, and we can push back on this by saying, well, yes, while there haven't been as many proven instances of certain negative health consequences such as cancer from e-cigarettes, cigarettes, a large reason for this could be the fact that cigarettes have existed so much longer, there's been so much opportunity for longitudinal research on them. We don't know yet what will come of people who have been using e-cigarettes for 30, 40 years. Um, the other part we can push back on is even if they haven't been proven to cause certain types of cancer or other health effects, it doesn't mean that they're safe. The optimal is to not use any cigarettes or any cigarettes. And the third one, everyone's doing it, but we can look back to some of Judy's handy data from the previous slides and we can say, no, that's really not the case. In many cases, it's only a minority, in a lot of cases, a small minority. Um, that are using e-cigarettes. Um, and oftentimes, I know that in my circles, in peer circles in general, among teens, um, people doing unconstructive or risky um, behaviors, it can appear that they are a larger group than they actually are. Um, so we can push back on this with data. So on the next slide, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the activism I've been doing here in Westchester County along with other youth. Um, with the support of amazing prevention educators and professionals like Judy. Um, in order to amplify our voices um, and the voices of teens who make drug-free decisions. So this picture you can see here, um, I'm hiding in the background in the back left in the cool sweatshirt, if you can <laughs> spot me. Um, but this is a picture from a rally we held a little while ago uh, at Westchester Medical Center, our local hospital. Um, and the purpose of this rally was not to kind of, uh, not to say no, you shouldn't be tisk tisk. Uh, the main purpose was to highlight the voices of youth such as myself and others, um, for us to talk about the reasoning behind our decisions to be drug free. Um, it was a really successful event. Uh, it got picked up by a variety of media who broadcast each of us explaining why we make the choices we make not to vape. Um, and I think initiatives like this are really important um, because they show that they're, well, first of all, they combat that assumption that we just talked about in the free previous slide, that everyone's doing it. Um, and they also really put the reasons for not doing it out there, which is important. So here we, um, we see some images from our recent April Fools rally at our county center, a local stadium in our area. So to give you some background on this, this is an event organized um, by the student-led nonprofit that I work um, with. Uh, it's called Youth Decide. I'm the Director of Legislative Advocacy and Expansion. And we put together this event in order to highlight um, the need for legislation and policy to restrict flavors in e-cigarettes. Um, so an important part of all of my efforts and the efforts of uh, the teams I'm collaborating with in Westchester County and surrounding areas has been to tie our voices, tie our demands to policy and specific legislative actions that we desire to be taken. Um, as Dolka mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, uh, last year I was very involved in the passage of Tobacco 21, a law in Westchester County which raised the age to 21 to buy all tobacco and e-cigarette products um, because uh, this has the effect of making it less likely that high school seniors and people between the ages of 18 to 21, as well as people under 18, will buy e-cigarettes, um, which decreases the prevalence of teen starting. Now, um, what this rally was about um, was a proposal to ban flavors in e-cigarettes. Earlier in the presentation, we discussed about how the packaging, the colors, the flavors in e-cigarettes um, are meant to market to new users. They're not meant to help smokers quit when there are flavors like eucalyptus, like cotton candy, like creme brulee, um, like a cool cucumber. These are flavors that are meant to attract new users to be cool. Um, and I and a lot of other youth have 
just pushed back on this and said, no, those flavors should not be allowed to be sold. If it really is a smoking cessation device, that's okay for former smokers, but then we can get rid of these flavors because they are not serving that purpose. Um, the argument you may be wondering from the e-cigarette companies has been, oh, we don't market to youth. Um, but you can make your own decision on that based on the evidence we showed you earlier. Um, but the rally was a huge success. We had a fool's candy shop display, um, which I get garnered a lot of attention. Um, we had some members of our county legislature and the New York State Health Department present. Um, I think everyone really took away what we were trying to um, spread as the message that flavors are what are hooking youth and need to be restricted and regulated in e-cigarettes. On this slide, um, you can see a picture of our meeting with the county executive um, and his staff. On the left, you can see Judy uh, and then some other members of our Youth Decide student-led nonprofit, um, some members of a local tobacco um, prevention organization, and then some members of the county executive staff. Um, and I have learned a huge amount from these behind the scene meetings with legislators um, and members of our county executive staff. Um, I found that private meetings such as these with government officials um, serve a twofold purpose. First of all, they're a great opportunity for teens to hone their advocacy skills um, and to really formulate in their minds why they make the decisions they make and why they're advocating for what they're advocating. Um, and at the same time, it can be an effective way to uh, amplify the voices of youth and spread them to government officials. Um, oftentimes hearing from youth firsthand uh, is what can motivate politicians to act. Uh, so I highly recommend if, if there, your government is accessible in um, the area where you live, which hopefully it is, um, that you um, figure out ways for teams to engage in legislative advocacy for substance-related causes. And I'm happy to talk more about this during the Q&A. Now back to Judy. Thank you so much. I just, um, I would like to say that um, Abe and his, I hope you got a sense from the pictures that Abe showed that we have a very diverse group of youth that are helping advance these initiatives. It happens to be Advanced Placement Week here in Westchester. So a lot of our youth are involved in all sorts of testing and stuff. And um, Abe and I were talking earlier about the Tobacco 21 issue, and I'm um, back here in New York, the New York Times ran a front page article recently about how many of the Tobacco 21 legis uh, legislative initiatives that are happening at the state level include in them a preclusion that, um, that the legislature will not touch the flavors in the, in the e-cigarette products. So you have to be careful when you're working on legislation to make sure, the devil is in the details, you have to make sure that, you're, um, that, the, that the legislation that you're working for doesn't undermine other uh, public health issues that you're working towards as well. Um, one of the things that we do in helping youth make vape-free decisions is that we try to find fun and interactive ways to educate youth and parents. Back here in Westchester, we have developed an escape room. Now, I don't know if escape rooms are uh, so big out where, where everybody in the listening universe is listening to us, but back here, escape rooms are, are a thing. And so we created an escape room that is vaping themed. And the premise is that you're trapped in a room with kids vaping. You're not actually trapped anywhere and nobody's actually vaping, but that's the premise. And you have to solve a series of puzzles and clues in order to escape the room. Things like this, um, finding interactive ways um, that sort of um, undercut young people's um, skepticism about this, undercut their um, rolling of eyes uh, that yet another adult is telling them what to do, I think is really helpful. We play Jeopardy games, we play, uh, Youth Decide had been working on a, um, on a board game. So we, there are all sorts of different ways to try to um, to make the, the learning fun and, in, and involve them all. Um, on the other side of the screen, you see a mock teen bedroom, and this is something that we take around and we use to educate parents. We have the parents come through. You would not know by looking at this room, which by the way is exactly what my kids' room looked like growing up. Um, you not, may not know just by looking at this room that there are like hundreds of different references to alcohol and other drug use, including um, including vaping. If you look really close, you can see a jewel charging in that computer there on the bed. So the, this is um, 
uh, something else that we do to try to educate parents. We also have taken youth around. We did this in partnership with our Westchester County Youth Bureau, and we did community scans. Again, many of you that have been involved in substance abuse for a long time, this will be, it won't be news to you. We've done alcohol scans and tobacco scans for, for many, many years. Um, this is just another version of that. And, um, and so in the middle of your screen is the takeaways that we, uh, that we had. We scanned three communities. We had 15 youth involved. And um, I would just point you towards the part that says vapes and candy because we found that vapes and candy were often displayed together, which was one of the takeaways that the kids were particularly um, concerned about. Next to the, uh, on, on the other two sides of the screen, you see it, the maps that I've just pulled up. So one of the maps is of El Paso, Texas, and every place, that, and I didn't mean to pick on El Paso, I just was looking for different places to sort of show, and I just went on Google Maps and Googled um, vape store locations, El Paso, Texas, and everywhere that you see a purple dot, according to this map, that's where it's possible to find a vape device. The other um, map is of Chula Vista, California, because I started my career in Chula Vista, California. So um, a shout out to Chula Vista, California. And that's this is off of the Jewel website. This is the Jewel store locator. So those are different places where you um, can find jewels. And I would just say, whenever I present, I really encourage adults to go into the vape shops in their community. And I think this serves several purposes. One, I think is all adults need to see what these devices look like. You need to hold them, you need to pick them up. And you also need to put the stores on notice that there are adults in the community that are watching what they're doing. So they're legitimate stores. You don't have to give them a hard time, but just say like, we know that you're a store in this community and we expect that you will meet all the standards of, you know, the uh, uh, proofing kids and, and being a good citizen of our community. And I think it's really, really important um, for people to do that. I would also say, um, I'm just gonna see what my, oh, before I get to the resources, I apologize about that. Just a couple of more things about prevention. So this isn't about vaping in um, particular, this is about um, prevention in general. We know that when young people hold a positive cultural identity, excuse me, that that is protective of their getting involved in risk-taking behaviors, including substance abuse. So I don't know this specifically about vaping, but I know this about substance abuse. So we do wanna make sure that we are helping our communities to transmit to their young people a positive cultural identity. We also know that all good, um, skill building that's related to all vape, uh, all substance abuse prevention should bear out in vaping prevention as well. So for instance, we know that helping young people practice refusal skills is good prevention. I was at a, um, I was doing a presentation this morning to a group of educators and we were talking about ways that they could help their the young people that they work with say no to vaping and one of them said we'll just tell them to say no and for some kids that's okay they can really like for Abe, Abe probably feels just fine saying no but for some kids that are more timid they need other ways so you can help them find the words like they can tell people that they're allergic to the products and vape devices and in fact they, they may very well be. There are lots of ordinary things, as Abe has been telling you. So we know that teaching good refusal skills, promoting positive cultural identity, cutting down access, reducing access, um, and um, teaching good, healthy um, coping mechanisms around other healthy ways to reduce stress. Those, that in and of itself is good prevention, but I have to tell you that I feel like I could go out and t speak to 3,000 kids about vaping and maybe change three minds, or we could pull the flavors out of vape devices and we would change 3,000 minds in a snap of a finger. So true. So um, that's my, now I'm, now I'm off my soapbox now, my prevention soapbox. Um, we did put together some resources for you. These are some Spanish language resources that we found. I do believe that um, drugfree.org, which is the partnership for drug-free kids, I know that Dolka mentioned that the PTTC is working with them on some Spanish language um, 
prevention materials. So that's wonderful. They're a fabulous organization. And I do believe that they have a call-in um, number that you can call and that is available in both English and Spanish. So that's a really good resource. Um, and, uh, and, and some of these others as well. Obviously, we didn't put them up here unless we thought that they were good. Here are some English language resources that can also um, be helpful. Um, Stanford University has a tobacco prevention toolkit that I think is excellent. Catch My Breath, that's something that CBS has developed that I've heard good, I've not seen it myself, but I've heard good information from, um, from educators that have used it. Um, it is developed by CBS. Um, I think I mentioned that already. This is quitting.com is something that comes out of the Truth Initiative. This is the only thing that I know that is geared towards young people that are vaping that want to stop. So apparently it's an app that you can download on your phone and it has a community of other young people that are trying to stop. You can um, get text messages from them. Um, you can, there's a skill building section, and then there's just um, other people that you can network with that are also trying to stop. Um, and then we didn't put this up here, we probably should have, but one of, um, one of Abe's colleagues, one of our colleagues, Jack Waxman, created a video called Jewelers Against Jeweling, and actually uh, Dolpa attended a workshop that uh, Jack and I did at, um, at CADCA, at the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America um, conference. And uh, Jack was there and he showed a piece of his Jewelers Against Jeweling. It's on YouTube, it's not in Spanish, um, and it won't be for every audience, um, but take a look and see if it will be helpful for you. So I think that that is the end of our formal, yep, that's the end of our formal presentation. And um, Abe and I are um, a welcome, are available and here to answer any questions, um, especially easy questions that you might have. <laughs> and just to add one more thing before we move into questions. Um, I mentioned that I do a lot of my substance prevention work with this student-led nonprofit Youth Decide. Um, and if you know of any youth who are interested in getting involved in more of those substance youth efforts and legislative advocacy efforts, um, feel free to contact us afterwards. Thanks. Yeah, we're looking for we're looking for young people, older people too, but really young people. Yes. So well, now we we're ready for questions. Yes, we are now at the Q A session. Uh, so let's see. We have a full house. We have a lot of questions coming through the chat to the Q A. We're gonna to try to answer as many we can. Uh, just a reminder, um, you, you may ask Judy and AB questions. You can type your question into the QA box and we're gonna to try to respond as many as we can. So let's just start with the first one, let's see. Olga Rodriguez say, how the fake community can help with this effort? I'm sorry, Joel, can you repeat how the state community? The faith, the faith community can help with this oh, the question. faith community. Thank yes. you so much for that question. You want to answer? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, Abe's taking that question. Go ahead, sure. Abe. Um, so I think um, this is a very good and important question. Um, a lot of times in many communities, especially communities where um, you know, the schools may not play as much of a role, um, the faith community, whether that be a church, a mosque, a synagogue, um, that can play a big role in after-school programs for youth, um, a big role in youth's lives. Um, and I know that personally, um, at my house of worship, um, there has been some, there was some ambivalence initially about getting involved with prevention efforts, um, but eventually our, our rabbi decided to um, kind of take the plunge. They reached out to our local community coalition um, and from there, everything really went on. Um, they gave a sermon about uh, the need for um, people to find help. This was in regards to the opioid crisis, uh, and I think it had a huge impact. Um, but I think faith leaders have a big role to play, whether that be in giving sermons, um, in running workshops, in distributing resources to teens who um, patronize their houses of worship. 
Um, but I'll turn it over to Judy. She has yeah, no, those are all excellent points. Um, I have a couple of other thoughts. I think I, I second um, Abe's statement about the importance of a faith community. We do know that when young people are connected to a faith community, that's a protective factor that helps prevent them from getting involved with alcohol and other drugs, including vaping. I think that it'd be wonderful, for instance, if a faith community had a bulletin that it sent, that it gave out with every service, if they had a fact of the week where they had something about vaping. You could even take pieces of the slide presentation that we put together and just put a fact of the week or just a picture of a jewel. This is a vape device. Talk to your kids. Uh, speaking from the pulpit to have a sermon about, about vaping would be brilliant. Holding a, a, a health fair at your church where, or, or, or synagogue or mosque or other temple, whatever your faith house of community worship is, would be a great way of, of, of doing that. And many communities have local community coalitions and they are looking for faith involvement. So Olga, I hope that answered your question. And by the way, Dolka, if you're interested, I would be happy to put together some um, items that people could put into their faith bulletins and you could disseminate it and that way people could just take it and drop it right into whatever it is that they regularly send out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so next question. Why will you, why youth is using e-cigarette ends if not they leave you to start a smoking cigarette, especially saying smoking trays in youth were declining, but now are, is a changing. So the question is why are they using? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, oh, go. So, hey, why, yeah. why in the world are kids using? So that's a great question and I could spend hours talking about it, but um, I'll, I'll give, give the brief summary. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with what we discussed earlier about um, the misleading marketing, the marketing and flavors that are attractive to youth. Um, the fact that jeweling and other forms of popular e-cigarette use are not perceived as dangerous. I'd say that's one of the biggest things. The fact that they're not perceived as dangerous um, and the, yet there is some risk associated with it because you can't buy it in most places if you're under 18. Um, so that combined together along with the fact that they do have tasty, quote unquote, flavors, um, flavors that attract youth. Um, all of that conspires together to make people use it. And then the nicotine in many of these products makes them addicted to it, which makes them start using it more frequently, which encourages their friends to use it. Um, and so it's kind of a, like a compounding cycle like that. Yeah, I agree. I, I was speaking to a group of young people um, the other day, and one of them said to me, how come jeweling became so big so fast? I don't, I don't know if that's the issue everywhere in the United States, but certainly in Westchester, it's all about the jewel. So why, how did jeweling become so big so fast? And what I said to them is, to the kids is, we, the adults, we set the kids up. We made a product that was attractive to kids. We made it so that they could easily hide it from parents. We marketed it to them. We flavored it so that they would like it. We sold it everywhere that they were. We priced it so that they could afford it. And now we're suspending them from school for using the very product that we set them up for. So I would flip that question on its head and say, you know, what, is we, what are we as adults going to do to help prevent kids um, from vaping? Because kids are really doing what we set them up to do. Dalka? So the next question is, is say where I can get a Spanish language poster for my office on vaping. Excellent question. So you can go to our Spanish language resource page. I am pretty sure that some of those um, resources that we that we put up there have Spanish language posters. If you do not find that, I want to say. Um, email Dolka or, or get in touch with Dolka and, and we will find it for you. So if you don't find it on those resources, uh, hound us until we get it for you because we absolutely want to make that available to you. Perfect. So also I want to tell you that in the resource slides that we have in Spanish, 
you have a poster that is for parents, one poster that is for teachers in Spanish with information about vaping. Right. So feel free to click on those links and you will find that those are, those are from the CDC. So you can, you can easily use it, download it and print it. Thank you so much, Doka. You're welcome. So now we have Jennifer Asidera say, um, can, we, can you please share about the plan or directions for the youth escape room? I would love to do it with my youth in Redley. So before uh, Judy answers that question, <laughs> I just want to say that I have done Judy's escape room. My parents have done Judy's escape room. My friends, my peers have done Judy's escape room. And it is truly amazing. It is like no other prevention tool I have ever seen. It, it's really fun. I know oftentimes people say things are fun and they're not really that fun, but this is actually extremely fun and educational. Um, it's something that you know, people would pay money to do on a Saturday night. Um, so it, it's a really great prevention tool. I think this is a great question. And I'll turn it over to Judy. I wonder if Abe is just saying that because I promised him cupcakes later today. <laughs> um, so I will, I will make that available um, to everybody. Dolka, can we do something afterwards where we just get information out to all the people that were registered here? Yes, we can okay. do something to this. I, I will send out the information about the vape escape room um, and Dolka will get it out to everybody registered. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. So now we have a question from Yvette Torres. He say, do we know how much is being spent on marketing vaping to Latino youth. Wow. That's a, very That's a really, really good question. Um, I don't know that off the I'm going to say a lot, um, but that's probably not what the answer Yvette was looking for. So we're going to get back to you on that. We will, yes. we will have an answer for you on that. Abe is making a note. Um, how much is being spent on... To marketing Hispanic. to Hispanic youth. Okay, we got it. We're gonna be on that. Thank you. Do you have, Gabriela Rosales is asking, do you have any date about circumstances and would you start vaping for the first time? The age at which you start vaping for the first time? Yes. So, um, as we, so the Monitoring the Future survey, um, which Judy mentioned earlier, um, that collects a lot of data about when people start using across high school. Um, and what we see is that in general, although this isn't always the case, um, and as we discussed, it's harder to, hard to make complete generalizations, but in general, use increases as age increases. Um, so you usually have some students starting in eighth grade. Those students are continuing throughout high school, um, but each year the proportion of students vaping increases um, so there's no one age when students start, um, but it's a progressive increase over the course of high school years. I would agree with that. I would say that in our county, we're seeing it, and, and not just in our county, because I have the opportunity to go out and speak um, locally and even, uh, and even nationally. I would say that we're seeing some kids initiate in middle school, but really it's when you get to the high school that you see it as, as a much bigger issue. Thank you. So now we have Hector Reyes. He say, why vaping is not illegal on school campuses? They, they get, get suspended, but not seated or arrested. So uh, that's a very good question. Um, so many schools, yes, they have made rules of restricting vaping. Um, but there are, in many cases, laws don't prohibit vape use. Um, in most places, it is illegal for people under the age of 18 to buy e-cigarette products, but there are really no laws regulating e-cigarette use or flavoring. Um, and it would be great if there was an easy, um, all positive way to implement um, really legal restrictions on vape use. Um, but from what we've seen in our attempts to research that, um, it seems like that would um, receive a lot of pushback. It would require a huge amount of enforcement money um, and wouldn't altogether be that feasible. So that's why we've taken the approach of looking at flavors, trying to restrict flavors, trying to restrict points of sale, trying to restrict marketing, 
prevent teens from starting in the first place um, because we believe we'll be able to build more of a consensus and that on these legislative proposals and that they'll be more likely to be passed. Great. Okay, so we have um, now um, one person from Southern California. He said that where the legal age to buy nicotine is 21, and he's asking about um, around the other state, are the law difference? Yes, the laws are different. Uh, there's no standard age of purchase. Um, uh, New York just went to Tobacco 21, but not all states have that. Some states have a tobacco purchases at 18. Um, there is uh, there is a push to have a federal uh, standard of Tobacco 21, but we need to be careful about it because my understanding is that there's also discussion in that of not allowing any limitation of flavoring. So we don't want to trade one one good policy for one policy that would be against the public health of our youth. So we need to be careful about that. But that is, that is correct. There is no standard um, age of purchase for uh, tobacco products. Thank you. Now we have Juliet Leonard. He said, um, yes, I would love the packet for the faith community. So they are asking a lot of people from the faith community is asking that. So. Ricardo Torres say, do you have a listing of chemicals that are found in the vaping beside nicotine? Yes, um, we do have a list of chemicals that are found in vaping products besides nicotine, but it varies a lot from product to product. Um, so there's no one list. Um, but So I could name a few now, but we do have a list that includes diacetyl, nickel, chromium, um, and many other substances, but we can distribute that list. Yeah, the issue really is, as Abe said, it depends on the vape device and also what's what's in the e-juice. And um, once you superheat it and turn it into vapor, then it creates other chemicals around it, is my understanding. So it's hard to get one set list, but none of it is good. <laughs> yes, that's for sure. So but in terms of the faith community thing, Doc, I'm definitely going to work on that. I'll come up with like maybe um, 12 uh, different things and I'll, and I'll send it to you. So we can, we should definitely be able to have that within the next week. Great. Thank you. No, we have a full house. So we have lots of questions coming into the QA. So now let's move to the Rosendo in Inigue say, have you partnered with Latino with local Latino serving organizations, nonprofits, to address the high prevalence of vaping among Latino youth? And if so, what do, does that like? Yeah, do you want to? Sure. Um, so I think Judy has um, done this possibly to a larger degree than I have. But one initiative um, that I've been working on is I serve on the Youth Advisory Board of our county. Um, they actually know very well the person who runs the, who's the chair of the Hispanic Advisory Board in our county. Um, and we've been working together on um, creating a set of translated prevention materials that the County Youth Bureau um, can distribute. And so that, that's really been my involvement, Judy. Yes, we partner very closely with a number of different um, community organizations that serve Latino uh, and Hispanic families in our community. One of the things that we find, uh, for instance, is um, that it is difficult sometimes for um, members of the Hispanic community to come out to, e for parents to come out to evening presentations. Sometimes the shift work that they're working doesn't allow them, doesn't allow them their schedules to come out. And sometimes the places that we hold the uh, meetings are um, in this day and age can be scary for some, for some people. So if we're holding it at a city hall, for instance, and the, the, court building right next door. So we're trying to take our message to the places that um, Hispanic and Latino families already are and where they already feel comfortable. So we'll bring our vape escape room to an after school program that's specific for uh, that community or we'll bring our hidden in plain sight room to parents at um, at a community center where they're already congregating. We'll bring our, our program to a, a a church where that has a large population of Hispanic families. And I think that's really what the what the partnering has looked like. We've really tried to be sensitive to the um, 
to the access issues that are important to uh, people in all different communities. It's really important. Thank you. Now we have Angeline Irizarry. He say, why are tobacco vaping advertisements so prominent in the Latino, is this a minority communities? Well, there's a great quote by a tobacco uh, executive from back in the day that says something like, we don't smoke that stuff. We reserve that right for the, the poor, the young, the vulnerable, and the uneducated or something. So there, as I said earlier, there is a long history of, um, there's a long history of industries um, like alcohol industry, tobacco industry, preying upon vulnerable communities. And, and I think that is why, I mean, I think it's all part and parcel of the same thing, that, um, that that's why that they are active in the Hispanic Latino community. And all the more reason, you know, in, in this country, you either have to have a, a lot of money to make a change or a lot of people to make a change. So I know we don't have all that much money, but we have a lot of people and we need to raise our voices as loud as we possibly can in order to say what we want in our community. So if you get the young people in your community involved and you do a community scan, you can look at what you can look at the vape stores, you can have them do a community scan. Um, one of our one of our partners just did a community scan where they had people go around and using gloves picked up all of the garbage that they found that was vaping and tobacco related. And then they brought it and they dumped it on the tables of the elected officials and said, this is what's happening in our community. So you can get creative about it to really show uh, this is what's happening in our community. We had a, we had a community coalition that we worked in, uh, in an urban community, and there was a little tot park where the kids went and played. And we noticed that all of the billboards around where the kids were playing were all for alcohol, tobacco, or cheap divorces. And we're like, this is the, these are the billboards that these kids are seeing. And so the community partnered with a bunch of um, community agencies, and we purchased the billboards, and we had the kids create positive messages in English and Spanish, and we had their artwork go up where the tobacco and alcohol billboards had been. Um, and we had a news event about it and we celebrated the youth. And so now the Tot Park, instead of being surrounded by messages about alcohol and tobacco or surrounded by messages of, we love our youth and this is a safe place to, to hang out. So we need to be creative about that and we need to find ways to get the community involved in saying, this is our community and, and um, and this is not what we want. This is not. This this doesn't reflect our cultural values. Um, so we're going to do something about it. Perfect. Thank you. Now we have a question for Av. Say, how old are you? How do you get involved with all these? <laughs> awesome. So that is. Um, so I'm I'm 17 years old. Um, I'm a junior in high school. And so let's see. So how did I get involved, and how can one get involved? Um, so I got involved through my school. Um, the way in our county, uh, thanks to the efforts of Judy and many others, um, most schools have this thing called a community coalition, which is a group consisting of students, um, teachers, police officers, health um, officials. And so I joined that organization. And that, that's actually how I met Judy um, and how I met all the other people I worked with to combat substance use. So, I would highly recommend joining any organizations um, in your community focused on substance use, even if they don't explicitly say they're looking for students, um, because everyone loves to have students. Um, and the other thing I would say is many, many schools um, have SAD clubs and VASA clubs. SAD stands for Students Against Destructive Decisions slash Drunk Driving, and VASA stands for Varsity Athletes Against Substance Abuse. Um, and those are also great ways to get involved um, through the school, uh, along with your peers in anti-substance use efforts. Um, but if you'd like to know more, I would also recommend um, uh, contacting Dolka, who can give you our contact information. And um, also, if you're interested in getting involved, 
uh, shameless plug here, I would highly recommend um, joining Youth Decide, the youth-led nonprofit um, that I am highly involved in. Um, we're a great, friendly group. We do a lot of different things, ranging from media projects to legislative advocacy for flavor bans and similar initiatives to designing educational programming like um, anti-e-cigarette use board games um, and doing workshops with middle schoolers and teens at schools. Um, and if that sounds good to you or you think that sounds good to any teens that you know or work with, I please send them our way. We would love to work with them. We'd love to have them join our organization. Hey, Doka, does anyone want to know how old I am? Not yet. <laughs> it's coming, probably. So we do have a lot of questions on the QA bags, but we only have a few more minutes. So we're going to take maybe two or three more questions. And after that, um, we're going to proceed with the closing. So Janet, Janet Porter is asking, is the nicotines in these devices derived from tobacco or, or it is a synthetic nicotine? Oh, is it synthetic or is it derived from tobacco? So I actually it was uh, wondering about this myself, so I did some research. Um, and it is, uh, it, it's a complicated process, but I believe in the end it is derived from tobacco. Um, but it's not qualified as tobacco because it's a processed extract of it, if I'm remembering correctly. So it starts out from the tobacco and it goes yeah. through some sort of process and becomes the nicotine that's yes. in the vape devices. It's a hybrid. Yes. Okay. So the last question is say, um, give me one second. Okay. Do you feel that the hookah usage is a popular among youth as vaping? Uh, ah, that's a good question. So, Do you think hookahs is the, like the actual hookah, not the hookah sticks that are that are e-cigarettes, the like hookah bars and stuff like that? What do you think? Um, so I would say to, I, I'd say it depends, similar to uh, when we discussed Hispanic youth and vaping. Um, I think it depends on the community, the specific trends in that community. Um, I think in some cases, the traditional, I think hookah sticks are very popular among teenagers, but when we look at hookah bars, um, that is often a little less popular because it's harder to get in there, to get access to those hookah devices without an ID, without proof of age. Um, whereas for a device like a hookah stick or a jewel uh, that you can use anywhere, anytime, um, without someone carding you for use, um, I think those are often easier to access. But again, it, I think it depends based on the community. Yeah, I agree with Abe about that. And I think that's why it's so important. I know I've said this before, but it's really important for people to do their own local assessment um, and find out what's happening uh, at their very local level. Because in some communities, like I know there are some communities in um, northern Manhattan where there are a ton of hookah bars, and that is a huge concern uh, not so much where we are sitting right here in Westchester. So it, I think it's community by community. Perfect. Thank you, you all for the questions and input. I think we have a very rich conversation. I would like to especially thank Judy and A.B. for today's presentation. Thank about you. Yeah, thank you. And the topics and for all the work you do to educate us. So thank you so much. Now, as you see, we have our contact information Please reach out for more information about our projects and to request free training and technical assistance. Thank you for joining our webinar, Vaping 101 and Latino Youth Devices Risk Prevention Efforts and Solutions. Now is a very important part, evaluation. At the end of the, when we finish this webinar, you will be redirected to another page to complete evaluation we appreciate your participation. Your opinion is important to us. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation. Thank you. Gracias. Obligado.